Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Spectre melts down AMD, Drobo drops an AT, AMD's 590 benchmark, Intel's got a new i9, the Atom Amp is epic, and hey, there's a new Pine Model 3. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 492, recorded on November 15th, 2018. Spectre melts down AMD, and there's new Pi. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twits. And by Command Line Heroes, a podcast from Red Hat. Listen to epic true tales of the developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels revolutionizing the technology landscape. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit redhat.com slash heroes today. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most delightful, most affordable, the most expensive, the most outrageous. The, uh, you know what? We're here to talk about hardware, whether it's desktop, mobile, laptop, cell phones. We love the consoles. We love gaming. We love business. Occasionally, we even love servers. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, will you share the love for Mr. Alan Malventano from PC Per? How's it going? Ah! And the crowd goes wild. I'm, I'm, uh, I should have taken another Sudafed because um, the smoke got worse today. Uh, if you haven't been paying attention, California is once again on fire, uh, the deadliest fire in the history of California, which is saying something. And uh, you know, the air is full of houses and trees and dead people and all sorts of terrible things. And uh, uh, you know, it's after five days of of really nasty particulate matter even with a mask outside things are starting to things are starting to feel bad <laughs> inside yeah. my sinuses so i'm good uh, uh but i feel like my respiratory system is just over this entire experience but uh it's been exciting though you know yeah uh, it's a bit it's a bit frozen over here in the midwest i wish they could we could just merge both like take the heat from over there and Kind of like take the ice from over here and like put out the fires and you know warm it up over here and that. I cool. had a friend of mine who was dealing with forest fires up in Colorado, and the last one they had didn't go out until the first snow of the year, so it burned for the better part of three and a half months until finally snow fell and wow. crushed it. So we're waiting. Hope in theory the rain, the winter rains are coming um, uh, next Wednesday. So we're all hoping the the weather forecast is accurate. Um, I also have to make sure that everything in the backyard is cleaned up or those will be uh, wet. But it would be mm -hmm. nice to have the uh, the stuff washed out of the air. Uh, kind of a fun week this week. Um, uh, big excitement for me, kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of word from Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, until all of a sudden you get an email that says, it's that time. And it's like, woo! And in this case, uh, we got a $25 Raspberry Pi 3 Model A+. Plus which you can start ordering today. Um, same form factor as the original Model A, except that this one is uh, B, considerably faster, because it's got the same processor as Raspberry Pi 3. And like the original Model A, it deletes the Ethernet jack and three of the four USB ports. What you have here is a very, very compact and uh, fairly powerful single-board computer. And uh, if you're not familiar with those, you can use them for all sorts of things. Technically, you could use it as a... A desktop if you're patient um, but I find uh, turning them into things like audio servers and uh, and pie holes and other things uh, a lot more fun I also noticed that over in the corner there which I never saw before there is a Raspberry Pi TV hat so obviously I will uh, be investigating that in the near future I also want to point out that uh, like the Raspberry Pi Model 3 you are going to want to have a uh, a I, you know, I would recommend a good, solid two volt power or two volt, two amp uh, USB power supply. And that's a good, stealthy, a uh, good, healthy power supply, rather than grabbing that old 500 milliwatts uh, or that you know suspect but still semi-functioning one amp power supply. Uh, I would go for a nice, solid two amp, five volt power supply for this one because it's a little more power hungry than earlier Raspberry Pis, and 
it uh, will reward you with stability and joy if you feed it clean power. So I got one of these coming in from the UK, and I'll be talking more about that next week. But essentially, it should give you the same performance as the previous one, just in a smaller form factor. New pie, no waiting. Yeah, so. low price, really low price. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they did. Uh, they did remove some RAM and the Ethernet controller. Yes, and the well, they, they. I did mention the Ethernet controller and. You know, it only has one ETH, uh, USB port instead of four. Yep. So, yep. Did they? I yeah, thought they still, had the same amount of RAM. Uh, they talked about having it. I don't know. For the A plus, that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still but plenty I, of RAM. Like for you know, just you're just doing some simple projects, trying to get your feet wet with it. Twenty five bucks is just a steal. On the flip side, if you want a processor that costs nineteen hundred and seventy nine dollars. <laughs> um, it's moving in a slightly different direction and moving in a, in a completely different direction um, yeah Ken took a look at the uh, Intel Core i9-9980XE um, mm. so talked about this on the podcast last night and uh, it, it's basically it's replacing the 7980XE uh, which was about the same price Mm -hmm. but the only real difference is that it clocks slightly higher. I mean, everything else is the same. They claim it's, you know, 14 nanometer plus plus instead of 14 nanometer now, but it's still Skylake X. Um, basically, just a little, you know, a few more tweaks to the process uh, have been done. Um, but, you know, I mean, yeah, clock's a little higher, but now you've got, you know, as, as Ken was doing all this testing, the, the main comment was like, you've got some really competitive uh, Threadripper parts out there for, you know, depending on your workload, you can get away with uh, fewer cores or even fewer cores now that there's like the, um, you have the Threadripper 2990WX, but then there's also a, the 2970WX, which was one of those in-between parts that mm -hmm. I think just had like 24 cores, right? Um, but for some of his tests, he was able to beat this 9980XE with certain multi-threaded workloads, even with just the 24-core Threadripper, which is like nice. thir it was just like 13 or 1400 bucks, right? So, you know, you're you're getting close to half off the price there for, uh, again, depending on workload. Um, you know, I guess I guess the 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 oddity is if you're in the market for a CPU with a bunch of cores in the first place, any sort of bunch of cores, chances are you're after multi-threaded workloads that are probably going to favor the Threadripper on cost for performance, really. Um, hmm. and, then, and then on the flip side of that, you have uh, you know, the 9900K, which, came, which we talked about last week, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's an 8-core, 12-thread part, right? So that you already have a decent number of cores there. Uh, with with gaming performance and whatnot, that's is basically the, the takes the crown because it's the fastest single threaded and you know fastest straight line speed sort of sort of part there. So Intel's kind of painted themselves in their corner where they have this other part here where it's like it really should be like a workstation part, but they're trying to make it this end all be all like jack of all trades sort of thing. But in reality, it's not right. Like if you want the better gaming GPU or CPU, you go with the with the 9900K, if you want the the better, uh, you know, multi-threaded, like you just want all the threads to do all the things right. all at the same time, <clears throat> then you should probably lean more towards Threadripper. Um, you know, yes, the you know this part will go faster gaming than uh, mm -hmm. than Threadripper usually does, and if it's a memory sensitive workload. Uh, chances are the Intel side is going to be favored because Threadripper kind of has. It's kind of like an Achilles heel, is that those extra hops that that uh, Threadripper AMD side has to take via Infinity Fabric, basically the the way they kind of glue all their all their groups of cores together, all their various dies on in one package. You know, yes, there's some disadvantages there, but man, the, the prices on the Threadripper side, um, you're getting an, just an awful lot of cores for your money, um, even if they are a little bit slower. You can kind of brute force <laughs> your way through it, right? Um, well, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, 
not sure where, the, you know, and, and the other thing we're not sure on is uh, how long are we going to be on this 14 nanometer thing from Intel, right? Now it's like, how, how many pluses are they going to add to the end of that 14 nanometer? Uh, as many as they need to. I, I guess. <laughs> I guess it's not TikTok anymore. It's not a waltz. It's not a square dance. Like, I don't know how many steps they're going to be stuck on this one side of the, of the talk or the tick. Whichever way it was works properly for the for the uh, analogy there. So um, many analogies. So these uh, these i nine 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 eighty xes uh, since they're still Skylake based, they don't have any of the now. Granted, there wasn't a lot of mitigations that we saw come with the nine nine hundred K, but there were some mm -hmm. Spectre and Meltdown mitigations, right? Um, mm -hmm. This new part doesn't get those because it's still based on the same Skylake architecture. Um, however, uh, there are more Spectre and Meltdown, I think it's just Spectre this time, uh, more variants, uh, as Jeremy says, to cheer you up, um, <laughs> including the first Meltdown flaw to which AMD chips are vulnerable to delayed exception handling. Uh, so oh, yeah. Boy. Yeah, AMD was kind of waving the flag around about the Spectre and Meltdown thing because they're like, aha, we're not vulnerable to those <laughs> we're things. We're not vulnerable like that other processor you might be considering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and in some ways that, that, you know, those mitigations for those sort of leveled the playing field slightly uh, in favor of AMD, right? They actually pulled Intel's right. performance back in some areas a little bit. Uh, you know, kind of getting a little bit closer to AMD performance, and AMD didn't have to worry about it because they weren't doing the things that Intel was doing to gain Intel the you know the better speeds, basically. Um, so the, here's just another another vulnerability that's just going to probably impact both sides and <laughs> slow things down some more. I would imagine. Lovely. <sighs> you sound anyway. uh, frustrated. <laughs> um, so what frustrates me about this is a lot of the Spectre Meltdown stuff is uh, you you would really only be concerned about the vulnerability if you were worried about uh, some environment where you had multiple users sharing the same hardware and you didn't want like you know virtualized environments that sort of thing right. and you didn't want user A to be able to snoop on the information of user B but if you're just sitting at your PC and you don't suspect your system to have been compromised and you don't think there's any malicious code running anywhere that you're worried it's going to snoop some other process, just on your own computer, you're probably not mm -hmm. really worried about being vulnerable to like Spectre and Meltdown. So if you were that worried about the performance hit, uh, you know, you could just you could just turn that stuff off, right? Um, right? Steve Gibson actually makes a tool that lets you do that. He has this tool called Inspector. Mm -hmm. Um and it lets you a check and see if you're patched, uh, and b if you wanted to, you just got a couple of buttons on there. You can just turn those things off, see if it gives you a performance benefit. If you're not that worried about that particular vulnerability, um, you know, yeah, it's just it's just a, a very enterprisey kind of vulnerability that regular people just on their laptop are probably not that you know shouldn't be that worried. Uh, mm -hmm. about like their whole system being taken over just you know on account of that it, the most of the vectors here is the thing already has to be on your system and then once it's already on your system and it's got root game's over anyway it's yeah, not worried say, you're, you're, it's not it's not relying on specter and meltdown to, to gain further access at that point it's just doing whatever it wants in there you know there's there's dozens of other vulnerabilities that once you once something has root on your system is just gonna <laughs> As, be able to, as the hacker you know, folks like over. to say, you've been pwned. Yeah, basically, like, you know, uh, once you're there, that's it, right? Um, and there may be some ways in kind of using Spectre and Meltdown leveraged like via, you know, web sort of content. Uh, but any of that stuff, it's going to get browsed. It's going to get patched at the browser level. That's how you, you know, prevent those from getting in. So, yeah, that's just, that's where my frustration comes from is that, you know, Everybody jumps up and down and and they're like, oh, this is horrible. Everybody has to fix this right away. But really, it's in this case, sometimes the 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 cons outweigh the pros. Like, for example, the stuff I do, right? I test SSDs. Well, sure. Some of the Spectre meltdown patches 
impact SSD performance. <sighs> but I need to test I need to test the SSD. I don't want the bottleneck to be elsewhere. So I actually well, I'm to this day I'm still when I do testing I'm looking for just the performance of the SSD in an ideal scenario. So I have to account for not just the current state of Spectre meltdown, et cetera, but in the future when there could be, you know, CPUs that have hardware mitigations for that that makes those problems go away. Now the bottleneck would have shifted back to the CPU or to the <sighs> to the SSD. Sorry. Um so yeah, in in, in you know, in my in my uh testing and stuff, I have to like kind of dance around that because it's just something that's going to get in the way of the thing I'm trying to test. You just need to retest everything every time there's a patch. <laughs> yeah, no. There's like 200 <laughs> There's like 200 different SSDs that have gone through several days worth of testing each in my database. Um so yeah, no. Sorry. Won't be part won't of be I mean, retesting all part of what's interesting. <laughs> I was going to say, part of what's interesting when you look at the, the register.co.uk uh, article that, that uh, uh, we're talking about here that, that Thomas Claiborne wrote um, is, you know, one, ARM chips are in there and, and you know, the deck kind of says it where, you know, the manufacturers are like, this is hardware patchable. Uh, you know, his, you know, CPU slingers insist, quote, existing defenses will stop attacks, but eggheads disagree. And this is also one of those classic cases where the researchers are butting heads with the manufacturers. Um, it's a crazy yeah. list of people, um, you know. Yeah, uh, it is. It is of, interesting. You know, you know, and, and, just, and eventually, and eventually, uh, you know, once another uh, one or two generations of CPUs make it out there, like I'm sure these things are just, you know, will have been accounted for. But it's n it's not easy to just mitigate this sort of thing just on a no. dime um, without a performance <clears throat> hit, at least. You know, usually there's some sort of a workaround, which. Uh, which has been what we've seen so far, and it, it does have a slight hit on performance. Um, yeah, I was also the uh, you know the ARM based NVIDIA Jetson TX one is on this list, and my like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, it's you know uh, uh, I oh my goodness. <laughs> Moving on. Yep. Not to change subjects, but there's just. Uh, well, you know, we should just take a moment to thank our uh, our friends over at Rocket Mortgage. This this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. People, let's talk about buying a home for a minute. Interest rates are going up. Makes things unpredictable. People get nervous. You're hunting. Like, do I get a loan first? Well, my loan, my loan hold out so I get to the house. What do I do? I need an offer. Can I make, I can't make a cash offer. Other people are making cash off. People get just torqued, freaked out. There's anxiety around buying a home. It's just, it's, it's a big, long commitment. It's a serious commitment. Our friends over at Quicken Loans, they're doing something about that. They call it the power buying process. It's really simple. Step one, answer a few questions, simple questions. They're going to check your credit for pre-qualified approval. Step two, Quicken Loans, they're going to verify your income, your assets, your credits. They say they're going to do it in less than 24 hours and then give you a verified approval. That gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Because once you're verified, the step three, you qualify for their all-new exclusive rate shield approval. They're going to lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. If rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, they're going to drop your rate. Either way, you win. Think about that. Just look at that big old green check mark in that badge up there. You get verified, you get rate shield approval, and they're going to hold things. They're going to hold everything steady for you for up to 90 days. I think it's awesome, right? It's the kind of thing you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit. We want to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. I like the idea of reducing the amount of anxiety I have around purchases. <laughs> Call me crazy. You, uh, you've been, uh, the articles, the review's not up yet, but nope. you have... You have gotten your hands upon the Drobo 8D. My beloved 5D has a, a bigger brother or a bigger sister. Uh, it does. Um, they made some changes this time. Uh, well, it's it's really 
It's really more like the old Drobo Pro. Remember the Drobo Pro, the original one, like from way back when that had eight bays and a long time ago in a galaxy uh, far, far away. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the first Drobo that I did a review of, I believe. Um, so, uh, eight bay Drobo does all the usual Drobo things. You can mix and match sizes. You can, you know, they've they've increased the the volume size. So. To, to put this in perspective, the original Drobo Pro could only make a maximum volume size volume size of uh, 16 terabytes, which was huge at the time. You'd be lucky to even have enough drives of a high enough capacity to even you know hit that point. Uh, they've obviously had to increase this over the years because now you right. can get 12 and 14 terabyte hard disks, just one drive. Um, so now the limit is 128 terabytes per volume. And the, the total storage pool can be 256 terabytes. So that's like the total raw hard drive storage you can install in the eight bays. Um, so you should be good for a while on that. Um, they kind of changed the design a little bit. Now it has just a slot at the rear for a two and a half inch mm -hmm. SSD. Uh, so it's not like the MSATA thing with a little trap door on the bottom anymore, like what was on the 5D. Um, it's just a slot right in the back. You just slider drive in, it's almost like you're plugging in an SD card. Um, and that, that drive is, basically it's like an SSD that just uh, gives a, a read cache of the data. So if you're trying to do a bunch of random access activity sort of thing, you know, it kind of helps out with the performance there. Um, but, you know, drawers are, are kind of tricky here because they do charge somewhat of a premium for the technology. I think this part is either 1300 or 1400 bucks but it's an mm -hmm. eight bay drobo it has thunderbolt 3 it actually passes the thunderbolt 3 th through because it, it has you know two ports uh so you can actually hook up displays on the other side of the drobo and i think it feeds it's not a lot but i think it feeds 15 watts back to a mm -hmm. laptop so if you had a laptop plugged in it would probably just enough to keep it kind of topped off on charge if it was if the system was idle but if you're doing, you know, if you're doing a lot of stuff with it, it's probably going to start losing ground depending on how long that activity was going on. But again, better than nothing. At least it's providing something to your laptop. Potentially, it could, uh, depending on your use case, could save you from having to purchase a hub, right? Uh, so that you can right. get power in at the same time as you were uh, communicating with the Drobo. Um, we saw write speeds around 400 meg per second, read speeds a little bit over a gig per second. Um, That's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. Um, and that was that was with no SSD cache. That was just straight hard disks. Um, you know, it's uh, pretty impressive there. Again, these things are... What, what I've noticed is they, these seem to dislike random performance a little more. Probably because they're trying to expand this file system of theirs to be able to handle larger and larger volume sizes and just raw right. raw capacity. Um, so something has to give there. I would imagine those blocks are probably larger now. So don't expect to do a bunch of random writes to this thing. It's really meant for being a large chunk of storage, right? Um, you know, stick all your photos on it, stick all your you know large media, large video sort of thing. Um, that's where it's going to excel. But mm -hmm. on the flip side, remember that this is literally, this is a black box, right? You have to treat, <laughs> <laughs> my mentality on storage is you treat things as black boxes. So if you have a Drobo with a bunch of drives in it, that's only one storage thing. That is not a backup. Even if it's redundant, even if a drive can fail and it'll keep on chugging, even if two drives can fail and it'll keep on chugging, depending on how you set the options. Uh, don't be the person that complains that this device, which is fallible, like every device is, failed, and you didn't have a backup. Um, oh, there you go. It's uh, 1300 bucks. And I think they had a promotion going on where they gave you like, I think it was like 50 bucks off or, oh, free SSD. There's something going on with upgrades. Um, you just have to prove to them that you you know, have had a, a previous Drobo. Uh, I found out, you, chances are if you own a Drobo of any form and you had it registered with them for warranty, uh, they probably sent you an email with some form of promotion to, to try to give you some savings on this thing. 
But you know, for what it is, I've, I've been impressed with it so far. Um, I still think the price is kind of high in light of uh, prior Drobos like the the 5C that came out like you know a couple of years back, which was a five bay, but had decent performance. It was able to do like three around 300 meg per second reads and writes, which was impressive for just like a, a you know five drive device that was again a couple of years back. Uh, and the price on that was like two or three hundred bucks. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that was very you know that was a good price on that. I would just wish that would have carried forward here, but it looks like Drobo's going after uh, you know a, a more of a pro market here with uh, with this particular device. And if you're worried about the price and it kind of turns you off, then uh, you know again look look at those five bay models because they're they haven't gone up in price. They're still you know they're still decent. Um, but yeah, we did, we did have sort of a back and forth discussion at the office the other day about this, uh, as far as like pros versus cons and like, yes, it is pricey, but there's really, uh, you know, you can't directly compare what a Drobo does to a typical raid because none of the other NAS devices that I'm aware of, uh, can have a drive fail. And then if there's enough room across the rest of the storage pool to be able to store all of your data across the remainder of the drives, it will automatically rebuild and it will restore the level of redundancy that you had. So, you know, say you're only using half of the capacity, a drive fails, it'll shuffle everything around so that once that process is done, another drive can fail. You know, and that process could just repeat until you've run out of spare room to be able to do that that rebuild and that restitching of the data, um, in which case now you're now you're actually at the point where you have to replace a drive, otherwise you're at risk. Where if another drive fails, you're going to lose information. Um, but yeah, I mean that's you know, I mean I I have fairly industrial style RAID hardware that I use at the house here, and I, I it's not that flexible. Um, mm -hmm. I have to have a I have to have a spare drive set in order for a drive to you know, be automatically rebuilt to upon a failure. But that's only a one-shot deal. A uh, drive fails, it rebuilds to the new drive. If that happens again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at risk until I've replaced the drive. Whereas the Drobo could just, you know, if you go way overkill on your storage, you could let the thing sit there for months and have like multiple cascade failures of drives and it will just gracefully just keep on chugging, which is, you know, it's cool tech. Uh, Seems it's a little like pricey, it. and uh, you know sometimes the performance isn't as fast as people would like. But for what it is, you know, gets the job done. When we look at uh, at GPUs, we've been seeing, of course, we've been obsessed, right, with the RTX cards, the 20 series cards from Nvidia. That's been the big announcement this year. Um, the 1070 Ti has caught our caught our eyeballs, uh, but of course, AMD is still out there, and AMD. Basically went out uh, guns a blazing, if you will, to take out uh, the 1060 in terms of the mid price market. A couple of really great reviews out on this. Uh, uh, Ken, of course, over at PC Per wrote up the AMD RX 590 review featuring XFX. And uh, man, this is uh, you know it's 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 interesting, right? Because uh, Hard OCP did a good. Uh, review of this PC Per did a good review of this. Um, if you are looking for 1080p gaming and you want to be able to game at max settings and you want to spend the you know the least amount of money you can, um, this pretty much nails the the 1060. Especially as Hardy Hard OCP points out, uh, if you want to uh, start overclocking it, it's got a lot of potential. Um, you know this is uh, you know this yeah. is a pretty That's, good deal. Yeah. It looks like it's selling for like 279. Uh, it's available. $279.99. Uh, at least that's that's sort of the on-sale price, um, depending on where they're you're looking for be, it. They're supposed to be lower. Um, they might... They're always know, supposed to be lower. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, these might actually come down to their MSRPs, uh, given the way that uh, crypto markets have been going. Actually, today, I think Bitcoin lost like 25% or something within five minutes. It's pretty crazy. Um so yeah, things like that will hopefully contribute to MSRPs of GPUs being like a legit thing. But if you, but if you look at those MSRPs compared to what you're getting, uh, RX 590 looks pretty dang good, 
uh, over a 1060, even a 1066 gig card, of which the 590 has 8 gig, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, and in theory, a lower price point uh, than even a 1066 gig. So that's that's pretty good. That's a lot of performance for the money there. If you're looking for just you know decent gaming GPU and you don't want to break the bank, that's um that's a decent amount of horsepower for you know for mid 200s, really. Yeah, I'll be curious to see. Uh, you know, of course, you know we're a biscuit away from Black Friday, so uh, I, I wouldn't expect a ton of availability on these cards. But man, um, it's that's nice kind seeing, of exciting. It's nice seeing cheap yeah. GPUs again, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, there's not going to be one that's short enough to to uh, to use in one of my cases. But uh, that's a good price, and the performance looks really good. Um, the comments are a little harsh, but the comments are always a little harsh. Um, but it was kind of crazy. Um, hard OCP got it up to like 1670 megahertz, um, uh, yeah. with a little voltage, uh, tweaking. Um, man, that's, you know, the, the 12 nanometer process is, I think, working out pretty well for this GPU. Um, I'm very curious because that was one of the things that, that I think Ken also pointed out. It's like it's not that much faster than a 580, but it is, uh, and then it gets a lot faster. I think if you overclock, so um, that's pretty cool. You yeah. know, I, you yeah. know, it's I, it's it's an option. You know, I'd still want to oh, save yeah. up for a 1070 if I could swing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of view sets get caught up in the whole like you know, price be damned sort of thing, right? Like yeah. they're, they're just looking at the performance. They don't care how much the thing costs. Um, and it's, it's good to kind of temper your enthusiasm of any given product. I mean, yes, it might be the fastest thing, but if it costs three times as much, you know, <laughs> it's, you got to be able to afford the thing as well. Right. Um, yeah. Especially if you're only getting a small percentage of a gain over the things that are significant, you know, cost significantly less. Um, but in this case, you're getting, you know, you just need a GPU to do gaming on. Again, remember 1080p uh, still to this day, even though there's all sorts of different monitors out and G-Sync and FreeSync and all these other things. The majority, uh, by a long shot, the majority of PC owners and gamers are on 1080p. Yeah, that's what their monitor is, and it's not even yeah. a high frame rate 1080p. It's just 1080p 60. Your standard run-of-the-mill, you know, kind of display, um, and a card like this will do just fine for that. You know, you don't need fire-breathing GPUs to be able to to push just 1080p 60, even with, even at reasonably high settings in games. There are worse things than having options. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by Command Line Heroes. It's an original podcast for geeks by geeks from Red Hat, an open source company that's been bringing open source technologies into the enterprise for 25 years. What's a Command Line Hero? We're talking about the developers, the programmers, the hackers, the geeks, the open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. Command Line Heroes is hosted by Saran Yitbarak, a developer who co-founded Code Newbie and lives and breathes open source software. Season two of Command Line Heroes, all about living on the command line and tracking the changes that shape the world of open source development from programming languages to learning about supercomputers, hybrid clouds, and more. On the latest episode here, our DevSecOps teams bring heroes together for better security. Bad security and reliability practices, they lead to outages that affect millions Discovering one vulnerability per month used to be the norm. Now software development moves quickly thanks to agile processes and DevOps teams. Vincent Danen shares how that's led to a drastic increase in what's considered a vulnerability. Jesse Robbins, the former master of disaster at Amazon, explains how companies prepare for catastrophic breakdowns and breaches. Josh Bresser is the head of product security at Elastic, looks to the future of security in tech. Visit redhat.com slash heroes to check it out today. Subscribe to Command Line Heroes wherever you get your podcasts. And visit redhat.com slash heroes for extras and to learn more. That's redhat.com slash heroes. And we thank Command Line Heroes from Red Hat for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware.
you all know that I'm obsessed with audio and better audio, whether it's for gaming. Well, mostly for music, but also for gaming. It turns out, generally, things that make for good music listening also make for excellent uh, playback of soundtracks on video games. Call me crazy. Yeah. Uh, I know you yeah, like yeah. A, good, uh, a good audio product, audio product uh, Alan. Um, yes, I am, I am a slight, uh, I am, I'm quasi-budget audio snob. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't. I won't buy the thousand dollar cables. Uh, it's okay. You know, I don't want you to buy. I do like a good amp. Cables. Yeah, I like a good. I like a good set of speakers, a good amp, things like that. I, I don't think I want anybody to buy thousand dollar cables. If you want to buy one, by all means. The thing I want to give you a heads up: uh, the crew over at JDS Labs. Uh, they're out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, technically, they're they're in Southern Illinois. Um, they build their boards in the United States. Uh, you know, they see and see all their higher end projects. They they see and see the boxes for those uh, in Southern Illinois. Um, they design, they engineer. It's all um, U.S. manufactured stuff. What you're looking at right now is the Atom amp. It's ninety nine dollars, and it's really slick because you can use it um, as a headphone amp. You can use the RCA jacks on the back of it to output to uh, an amplifier. So if you're like me where you have speakers on your desk, but you you use headphones when you don't want to be hated by everybody else in the audience, um, audience in the, everybody else in the uh, – <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. If you don't want to be hated by everybody in the, in the office and use your headphones, um, you know they've got a 3.5 millimeter input on the back. They've got uh, uh, RCA inputs on the back. It's not a DAC, but it's an amp and a preamp, right? So it's really flexible. And what's crazy, um, JDS Labs designs to deliver better audio than you can hear. And th they really, uh, John and the crew there really went, I say John, really, the, the engineer there, kind of got out of control. Because if you, if you take a look at uh, Audio Science Review did measurements of this. And if you, if you click onto that link and scroll down, um, you've got this crazy bar chart. And uh, yeah, the, the, the measurements on it are spectacular. But, but keep going down. Keep going down. There should be a, a, there it is. See that red bar at the left? That's the hundred dollar, the ninety nine dollar JDS Labs Atom. Right next to that, at one hundred twenty three decibels, is the Masterop THX seven eighty nine, which is a fantastic uh, headphone amp that costs three hundred forty nine dollars. Um, you know, this is some of these products on this list, like the Monoprice Liquid Spark, also excellent, one hundred fourteen dB. But it's kind of crazy. There is. Um, there is no noise in this headphone amp. I, I don't think any of these deliver any audible <laughs> noise. I mean, these are all spectacular products. The iFi Nano IDSD, Monoprice Mono, this is THX Portable, the Cord Mojo. Um, there's a lot of beloved stuff here. Um, it'll drive just about anything. If you if you scroll down on the next chart where the output impedance, um, that little red spot you probably can't see even if you're watching the video at home uh, is the uh, uh, JDS Labs Atom. Uh, and it's surrounded by any of a number of products that cost uh, significantly more, like five or six times as much. Um, but what's really cool also, if you if you go to the next one uh, where it says frequency response, there's basically a line. Um, it's just, it's that just is horizontal. Say, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, and, goes past, and, uh, it goes past what looks like almost hitting 40 kilohertz. Yeah, it's, it's uh, 10 hertz. It still hasn't 40 fallen hertz. off. Yeah, I mean, it's below what you can hear. Uh, it's above what you can hear, and it's essentially a flat line, which basically means whatever signal's going into that thing, um, you're just getting a louder version of the signal coming out of that. And uh, it's a really impressive piece of hardware. It's $99. And, you know, I've, I've talked a lot uh, recently about how there's just this really spectacular, um, there just seems to be a movement in a lot of ways. Um, you know, you might not think of... of of an $800 set of headphones as being a bargain. But when you look at, at the kind of, you know, $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 headphones, that's something like Mr. Speaker's um, uh, Aeron competes against. It's a pretty impressive piece of hardware. Um, but it's, uh, you know, there's, there's ELAC is doing some really amazing speakers that don't cost a ton of money. Uh, Emotiva's got some great amplifiers and uh, integrated amplifiers. Um, I'm just really kind of jamming on how many awesome things there are out there. You know, case in point, you could start out with a, man, a Chromecast audio, plug it into the back of that JDS Labs uh, Atom amp, have enough power to power just about any headphone uh, you might want to purchase or could afford to purchase, and it's going to be spectacularly clean. I mean, there are considerably more expensive 
headphone amplifiers. They might have a prettier case and they might have a really cool meter on the front, but they're not going to deliver better performance. Uh, you know, there's maybe a tiny short list and none of them are going to cost anywhere near that price. But, uh, yeah, another good, uh, another interesting product that came out recently uh, at that hundred dollar price range, uh, the Monolith by Monoprice Liquid Spark headphone amplifier by Alex Cavalli. Um, it's measuring really good. Not as good as the JDS Labs Atom amp, but it's measuring pretty good. And if you're thinking like, man, okay, so I wanted to mention some some really amazing performing headphones. Um, that's the M five sixty five C over ear. I heard those uh, this summer. They're playing our magnetics from Monoprice. They're closed back, so you won't irritate everybody in your house when you're gaming at 2 in the morning or listening to music. That's a really impressive planar magnetic headphone, um, which essentially, instead of using a little tiny speaker, it's got a basic, uh, it's got a big sheet of plastic, um, you know, with... uh, 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 I I, want to say, I always want to say copper runners, but uh, uh, essentially you run... uh, It's a sheet of plastic that you run electricity through in between two uh, magnets and that big sheet of plastic, I'm oversimplifying here because it's easier, uh, is what moves back and forth. You have this massive wall of sound going towards your ear and they deliver some pretty extraordinary, because it's very, very easy to accelerate and deaccelerate um, the plastic or the material. It may not actually be plastic that's moving back and forth and moving the air towards your eardrums. Um, You get this huge sound stage and excellent reproduction, really solid bass, uh, for not much money. Um, if that sounds like 200 bucks is too much, you know, something I've talked about for years, Sony's MDR 7506, they sell for like 80 bucks on Amazon. That is a spectacular headphone for the money. It will last forever. Um, you are, know. Those, are those like the new version of, well, didn't it used to be like MDR or like V3 or whatever? They're just the really simple V6. years and years back. This yeah, was- V6. The V6 is actually, I'm pretty sure they still sell the V6. A lot of people think they're the same headphone because they, they look almost exactly the same except for the label yeah. on the sides. Um, yeah. 7506, I've seen actual testing of them. They are different. Uh, they have a little bit of a different sound profile. I'd get the 7506 over the V6. And I used to own the V6. But, uh, um, you know, it's it just uh, kind of amazes me. Um how much good audio you can get, especially, you know, if, if you're been, if you're using a beat up set of headphones, um, you know, there's some pretty good stuff out there. I'll talk about some headsets next week. Uh, you know, if Justin, if, if we, I, are we recording next week, the whole black Friday schedule, the whole, uh, Thanksgiving schedule, maybe after black Friday, I'll talk about some gaming headsets, but, um, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get amazing performance. I just want to give a shout out to JDS Labs for just delivering an amazing product for the money. Um, you know, this is another one, uh, you know, one of my favorites for a long time has been uh, AudioQuest Dragonfly Black, which is a little USB thumb drive that has both a digital to analog converter and a headphone amp built in. And that typically sells for around a hundred bucks. Um, and that's uh, it. Kind of amazes me that if you um, if you shop around, you can get some really really amazing sound uh, for not that much money. Um, I also bring that up because I'm really frustrated because I also see a lot of high-end audio products that are stupid expensive, um, but don't perform any, uh, any, any, any really measurable or audible, uh, uh, amount better than a lot of the existing products. So just want to give a shout out to JS labs. Monolith is doing some good stuff. Uh, those Sony's are always a classic and, uh, I just have to, uh, sign this really quickly. (laughs) <laughs> I think I think I I think those monoliths are the ones that you let me hear at one point, didn't you? Like a weren't they like a like a beta version of them or something you were testing out? There was some planar no, magnetics. No, that was were... a that was a different set of planar magnetics. Uh, but uh, well, then just yeah, speaking we'll talk generally about planar magnetics. Like I, I'm a, I'm a believer having having listened yeah. to a set. Like they're they're pretty darn good sounding. Just the technology is yeah, good. You know, when yes. when there's when there's basically no mass to the thing that's moving, um, and is able to move a lot of air, you know, similar to like that crispness you hear with like electrostatic mm-hmm. uh, type drivers. Well, electrostatics but, are basically, uh, you know, uh, it's the electro- same sort of thing. Electrostatics uh, is creating uh, audio out of saran wrap using lightning because they're incredibly high voltage. Um, basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This this lets you similar effect, but actually can you can get uh, better low end out of them as well because um, electrostatics are just known for the low end usually lacking 
Um, yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. It's good stuff. So I uh, just want to give a shout out on that one. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, I'm uh, not going to tarry too long. Our air quality index, uh, I've just been informed, is well over 200, which is basically shut yourself inside the house and breathe through a mask level, um, which would explain uh, why my sinuses are falling apart. But uh, I also want to remind everybody that uh, if you back up now, you won't be trying to grab your computer or your hard drives uh, when the fires are bearing down on your community. And uh, run. Leave the hard drives behind. Whatever's on them is not worth your life. Uh, it's one of the things that came out. There's been an extraordinary number of deaths in this last round of fires, in part because of, of how difficult it is uh, to communicate in the region and because a lot of people are like, eh, it's a fire fire. It's, it's, it'll be over there. And uh, the intensity and the temperatures we're hitting, uh, this isn't about you know, having bushes too close to the house. These are these are the kind of temperatures where, where trees and, and, and building products just kind of spontaneously combust in a bit of an explosion. So um, obviously that's weighing a little heavy on me, so I'm going to say it now. Uh, back up your stuff so when uh, all hell breaks loose, you can run <laughs> like hell for a place where it's not burning. Um, yep, not to bring the mood down at the tail end here, but uh, I just, it's... Uh, it's nasty out right now, and uh, and uh, I hope it is not nasty wherever you are, even if it is like where you're at, Alan. Tremendously cold right now. So, <laughs> yep my my uh, wife did not go to the university today because the cars were all blocks of ice. <laughs> it's tough to start a well. You actually start an electric car. Does every does does the performance oh, of the vehicle start, go down? It'll start just it'll. Start, it'll start, yeah, I mean, the battery's cold. It, it accelerates a little slower if you floor it, right? Just the battery voltage is a little bit lower, things like that. But yeah, the performance is generally fine. But hey, you need to be able to actually get in the car. Um, you know, it'll start <laughs> just fine. Uh, but yeah, if you can't get in the car, any of the cars, it's not just it's not just those cars. Like we have four cars and couldn't get in any of them today uh, without like, you know, maybe if we brought a bunch of bu buckets of hot water out there and start <laughs> dousing the cars. Oh, my yeah. goodness. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If this is your first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. We usually call the the, the, the show we call Twitch. Uh, you can find more of the episodes and how to subscribe. Either A, just search for TWICH Twitch on your favorite podcasting tool or go to twit.tv slash TWICH and you will see all the older episodes. You can listen to them and you can learn how to subscribe. And uh, if you love the reviews that Mr. Malventano does. If you like the man and his perspective on the universe, do yourself a favor, get on over to PCPer.com, which is the website uh, he runs with the crew over at PCPer. And of course, you can find me over at TechThing, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com. Or if you're into the audio and video thing, A-V-E-X-C-E-L.com, the podcast I host with Robert Heron, where we talk about home theater and audio. As always, we want to thank each and every one of you for listening. Go back up your stuff right now if you haven't backed it up because you should have your stuff backed up in case you lose your laptop or something gets stolen or the house burns down or there's a flood or there's a tornado or whatever. Be prepared now so you're not freaking out later. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Alan Malventano. Catch you next week on Twitch. Twitch.